This is MSP Breakthrough, where successful MSP owners walk us through the pivotal moments that put them over the top. Now, Carl, uh, thanks for joining us today. So this is the Ninja RMM MSP Breakthrough podcast series. And what we do in here is we talk to current and former MSP owners about breakthroughs in their MSP that allowed them to scale that business. So it might be a little different today because we might want to go in some other areas. We might want to talk about, you know, one of my favorite topics is what would you do today? But also you've got all this experience. You owned a couple of MSPs and we can talk about what, what the major things that happened with you that allowed you to basically scale those up and then sell them. All right. Well, I'd say one of the biggest things that happened to me was that early on, I just I started signing contracts. I had I had managed major IT uh, setups for major corporations, and it, I didn't know that people didn't sign contracts in this industry. And so, at the beginning, I signed contracts, and that seems like a small thing, but contracts are not about what you deliver. They are about the relationship. And one of the things I think people don't know when they start out is that. Um, you think you're in IT, but you're not. You're you're in business, <laughs> and and as soon as you start treating it like a business, then suddenly the money starts to flow. And time and time again, you meet people who have been doing this a long, long time, and they're not making money. And invariably, they think they're in IT instead of being in business. And so they don't manage that side of the relationship. They just want to go fix stuff, which is cool. But if you just want to go fix stuff, you should probably be an employee. If you want to go make money, well, then you should start a business. And you know, people think they're going to make money, but we also think we're going to build 2,000 hours a year. <laughs> Carl, that reminds me of something. I'm pretty sure I remember this from one of your books. People get at this point where they're trying to do managed services, and they just they get stuck, and they don't put anything out there. And it's kind of like you just said, get contracts signed, get an offering out there. Am I right? Am I remembering something from one of your books here? Yeah. I mean, a lot of people get stuck because uh, they kind of think they want to do it, but they they start building their list, you know, the standard three-tiered list, and they get kind of stuck figuring that out. I have worked with people that spent a year trying to figure out what their offering is. And I, I almost feel like, who cares what your offering is? <laughs> Offer something because you can change it, right? You're not actually etching this in stone. You're printing it on a piece of paper and you can change it next week. So, you know, if you offer something and it sucks, offer something else, you know? You should always be fine tuning your business. I mean, I don't think I ever went three years without changing what we offered because we're in technology. The world changes on a regular basis. So you just have to have this mindset of, you know, better uh, can be the enemy of done, right? And so people looking for perfection just slow themselves up. Uh, I absolutely. That's a great point. I think, I think it's, you know, you sit there and you're like, wow, should I do this agreement at this price or is this the right price? And you get stuck too much in these details. And the fact is, is the way you're really going to learn how to do managed services is by making some kind of offering, getting a signed contract from someone, having a stack, and then based on that, you're going to be able to figure out and make, hey, that one's not quite right. I'm not going to do that again, or I'm going to change this out in the stack, or I'm going to contract this a little bit differently. But the, the main things I think I learned from you are, of course, get paid up front, make payment easy for them, uh, have an offering, and communicate that to the client in a contract that they sign. And then from there, start making your tweaks for the next one. Right. Well, the other thing to remember is, People like doing business with people. And, you know, when I started my second managed service business, I went around to people who had been my absolute best clients in my first managed service business. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I said, here, I just need you to sign this. And here's what we're doing differently. And I just told them what it was. And at the end of the day, the, the only question is, do you want to do business with me as your IT service provider? provider? And if the answer is yes, sign on the bottom line. Right? Your clients love you already. So when you go to them and say, we're just taking a step up in professionalism, 
it's, I think it's very easy. Uh, you know, I never really had any problem convincing people to sign uh, when we started making everybody go on to a contract because they all wanted to do business with us. Hey, Carl, um, you mentioned that you had a second MSP. Can you talk a little bit, just give some background around uh, how that came to be? What, what was the first one? What happened with that? What was the transition? Well, so I, I sold my first managed service business and um, what I did, part of the, the buyout was I got a payment, obviously, every month to be the core um, uh, advisor to the guy who bought it, right? So basically, we switched the name tags, but we both sat at the same desk and did the same thing we'd done before. I managed major projects. I managed his uh, public relations and marketing, and um, you know, I managed all of the big migration projects. And uh, I like to say that I was his outsourced personality, right? I, I dealt with the client, you know, side of things. <clears throat> and then after a couple of years, he sold that business. And so I was like, okay, well, you know, I'm, that that's the end of that. It's all good. And then I had former clients who came to me and said, you know, this new guy, we just can't handle him. And, you know, I'd been out of the business for, you know, technically uh, for a few years and so I decided to create a business literally based on the best customers I had from the first business. They all took my advice, paid full price, scheduled regular roadmap meetings to you know, figure out what their technology was doing and where it was going. And they were perfect clients. They were, they were my top tier clients. And so I built a business based on them. And I can tell you, there's nothing more profitable than a business based on your single most uh, favorite clients. Not necessarily the most profitable, but your favorite clients, because that you, you will be profitable with them. It's interesting, um, you know, doing this series, there's always these breakthrough moments people have. And by definition, that means that there was hurdles, there was challenges, there were roadblocks, right? No one, no one we've talked to had the simple story of, yeah, I started up, everything went great from the get-go, and we made a ton of money, and we sold, and we were, it was amazing. <laughs> There's always some kind of uh, uh, challenges that crept up, um, and a lot of times it has to do, uh, getting around those challenges, it seems like it's either had to do with um, some external circumstances. Tom's example, there was a great recession, forced him to do business differently, put him on a path to selling this business. In other examples, it's really kind of tied into... Um, the revenue marker, uh, th there seems to be right around like a, a half million, getting past a million. People talk about it in those terms. Can you, thinking back to your, maybe not your first business or maybe your second one, was there anything like that, whether it was an external factor that forced you to do things differently or whether you had these natural moments that you can kind of pinpoint where you had to start doing business differently? Well, one time that I, that really stands out, uh, I wasn't forced to do things differently, but I saw it as a watershed moment to do things differently. And that was way back in 2000 when Microsoft introduced Active Directory. There were a lot of people in our industry who literally said, I'm not going to learn this new technology. And as weird as that sounds today, right, the same thing happened when we moved to the cloud. The same thing, you know, happened when you know the world was taken over by Office 365. The same thing is happening with people who don't want to learn Azure Active Directory. Right? At every stage, there are people who opt themselves out of the market. And what I did in 2000, that was a real turning point for my business. Is I said I will only hire Microsoft certified professionals, and we will be focused on education. So we will not have anybody on our team who is not future focused and willing to learn. And so basically it put us at not necessarily the top of technology, but it put us up there enough that we could say, look, our competition might have one certified person on staff. We have everybody certified. When I had 12 technicians, every one of them had at least one Microsoft certification. Uh, Another big thing, and Tom and I had this in common, is 2008, 2009 sucked. <laughs> I had 
you know, uh, a bunch of people who were somehow related to the housing industry. You know, if they were selling houses, uh, they they went out of business. If they were uh, building houses, they went out of business. If they were providing services to the housing industry, they went out of business. Or they had tough, tough times. And so that on top of a divorce, 2009 really sucked for me. <laughs> I actually wrote a blog post like good riddance to 2009, you know, let's, let's move on for here. But you know, in your life, you will have uh, tragedies, whether it's divorce or the, the death of parents or, you know, a personal health crisis, stuff happens. And, you know, you can choose to see that as, a, a, you know, a mountain you have to climb or as a speed bump. And, um, as, as it's easy to say and hard to live through, but, you know, if you're going to be in business for 10, 20 years, um, you're going to go through a lot of stuff and you got to figure out what's important and what's not and focus on what's important and let that drive your business. And, you know, again, we're, we're in, in small business, we're in a people business. And so your clients will gather around you and support you and, and uh, be a part of what draws you forward in those tough times. I think that's great. Um, absolutely. You know, I think, that brings us to a point where we can talk about what's next because this pandemic seems to be letting up a little bit in this country. Uh, I've got a lot of questions from MSP owners out there about how they're going to do sales going forward, how things have changed. And so it's bringing up a lot of questions for people. What do you think is going to be a big differentiator, things that, that companies need to do in light of this pandemic ending? And are we going back to the way things were or what has changed enough that you have to change as an MSP owner? Well, uh, you know, uh, I do a podcast called Killing It with Dave Sobel and Ryan Morris. And uh, Dave and I are always arguing about how much people are going to go back to the way things are. I think most people want to go back. You know, now, now you can't go back. I mean, that's the other thing is I think probably at least 30 percent uh, of what's happened, 20 or 30 percent of the change will stay. Zoom will be with us forever. Online meetings, online sales will be with us forever. Um, but when I say you can't go back, you know, there's an old say, saying, saying uh, you can't step in the same river twice. It's not the same river and you're not the same person, right? So you wanna go back, but it, it's like, you can't go back to what things were like in 2019 just just ransomware, artificial intelligence, machine learning have made the world evolve too much. There's always new changes coming in, whether it's the move to the cloud or the move to new technology, whatever it is, um, you have to always be going forward. Um, I do think we have a huge opportunity to reprise the victories we had in 2020. The victory we had in 2020 is that our industry stepped up and helped our clients get remote, do it effectively, get the equipment they needed to work from home, do Zoom meetings and all that. And now the next thing is, I think every single person listening to this should be scheduling a meeting with every one of your clients to say, how are we getting back to the office? Will it be in stages? Are you coming back at all? Will it be one department at a time? Do you need a Zoom setup in your conference room? right? What, what technology changes? Have you figured out that you don't really need that server in the next room and we can put it in the cloud, <laughs> right? Whatever it is, you need to have a roadmap meeting and with luck, you will get your clients to start having regular meetings about their technology. And this is an opportunity more than has existed in many, many years. Carl, I think that's a great point is to schedule that with your clients, because on top of getting back to business, it's also, I think that we've probably turned a corner in how we're going to handle safety and, and, and not getting sick and those kind of things. And listening to your client about what their expectations are from you as a company and doing on site and making sure that you're kind of accommodating that a little bit. And then maybe going back to yourself and looking, well, our clients are concerned about sickness now when they weren't before. So we're going to put the following cleaning methods into place. And you know what? If you're sick in our company, don't come into work. 
that kind of thing. There's, I think there's going to be a lot of changes that we're going to see, but you need to make it a combination of what the client's expectations are and then what your expectations are and what you can reasonably do and involve that in your contracts and your negotiations with clients. I think you get a lot of people on board. There's probably a lot of money to be made by being very accommodating in these areas. Right. And, you know, I refer to them as roadmap meetings, um, a minimum of once a year, but ideally two or three times a year. You should get together with your clients and just ask them. And this is a perfect opportunity to say, okay, so how did you, how did you do in the pandemic or in the recession? Did you grow? Did you shrink? Is there new technology in your industry that I should be aware of? Are there trends? Uh, did one of your competitors disappear? Did, did one competitor get bought out by somebody else, right? What is going on in your business? And, you know, obviously clients love to talk about their business and themselves, and you can just sort of figure out what that means for their technology. The, the best part about roadmap meetings is you can make decisions about the future without spending money today. So you can say, okay, so when that server is finally three and a half years old, we're just gonna move the data to the cloud and uh, we'll put you on cloud storage. That decision can be made six months in advance without spending any money. And so there's a lot less pressure to have that discussion. And then when the day comes, you say, hey, let me just get you a quote on that. Hey, Carl, there's one thing I wanted to ask you that goes back to um, an earlier part of the conversation. And you're bringing up the, the very, um, uh, very big point of people like to do business with people. That where it's not just selling technology, it's, this is a business. And, and at the end of the day, where it's we're in business for people, right? Um, how much of your businesses, whether it was the first one, the second one, all of them, uh, did you see as kind of an extension of your yourself, really? Um, because it sounds like a, so much hinges on personal relationships, uh, how your clients feel about you as a person. And then in the meanwhile, you're also looking at building a business that's bigger than just one person in case you get hit by a bus or in the case of a, a eventual acquisition, someone can come in and, and, and buy a business and, and have it run with, with you maybe no longer in the picture. Although it sounds like it's interesting when you talk about your first business, you stayed on for a while, kind of still, still being that face. Um, so any advice about, about that in terms of people just getting started and, and how much um, they're thinking about making this an extension of themselves versus building for something that can be bigger? Well, great question. So I did something I didn't realize I was doing at the time, which is I put a lot of my personality into my business. And uh, I now believe as a maxim of how to proceed that you should just create the business that you love and then go find people who want to do business your way. And don't have fear that people are going to say, oh, well, you know, you're not fitting into this box or whatever. Um, a great example is that uh, when I do marketing, um, I have a, somebody who helps me with marketing. So 50% of her job is marketing. And I'll say, well, what if we do this and this and this? Her first question is always, does that fit with your brand, right? And and she knows my brand because it's how I prefer to show up in the world. And so I'm not super corporate, but I'm also not, you know, running around in flip-flops and shorts, you know, at my client's offices. <clears throat> so I've got a way that I want to show up and it takes a while for her to figure that out, but clients get it. And, you know, just no matter who you, you look at how you pick somebody to buy a car from or to give you legal advice or uh, to, to mow your lawn and they've got a way that they do business and you find one that meshes with the way that you want to buy services and, and you do business. And so um, it's the most natural way for you to be is to be yourself and then find people who want to do business with whoever you are. <laughs> um, and, you know, you've seen it at, at conferences. There are people who do magic and do juggling at sales meetings. And there are people who insist on doing a slideshow um, and, and leaving the questions till the end. They're like dramatically different approaches. They're both making money, right? The way I look at it, there's 7 billion people in the world who haven't done business with me. So, 
somewhere in that there are the 15 or 20 people that I need to sign contracts with to have a profitable business. Thanks for listening to MSP Breakthrough, brought to you by Ninja RMM. If you enjoyed this episode, please subscribe, like, or give us a review. 